Hey, what's up? I just wanted to go over some unit testing basics because this seems to be like um, it's such a simple thing but it's so confusing to a lot of people and I think it's super important for anybody who would dare call themselves a soft software engineer to understand this stuff. Um, I'm not a big unit tester because I work independently and they're not required. I would like to be more of a unit tester and if I took on more serious projects I would definitely do so. Um, that being said I'm rusty as far as like in-depth unit testing but I pretty much I feel like I really get the basics of it for the most part. I might forget a thing or two here or there in this explanation but I feel like I really understand the the overall the simple concepts that can of course scale any problem can scale and become more and more little problems you know once you start breaking things apart <clears throat> excuse me so that's kind of the trade-off here is that you can do really ultra simple unit testing and you can do fairly complex unit testing the idea is to pretty much keep the tests themselves really on the simple end individually but you may have to create collections of tests and um, share code between tests and stuff like that. Um, tests shouldn't depend on each other, I'll just say that right there, but sometimes there might be helper functions that do common stuff such as setups and teardowns of things, but um, for the most part the tests themselves are always independent of other quote-unquote tests and uh, for the most part you kind of want to try and give each test a, a fresh environment. You don't want it to rely on any side effects. Um, that being said, sometimes there there are certain side effect situations you may want to test for, but anyway, I'm just going to keep it ultra simple. That was almost scratching too deep in how far I want to explain. So this is a page from Microsoft uh, Developer Network documentation, I believe, that is looks like Video Studio 2019. Unit Test Basics. The only people that I probably agree 100% or at least 99% with what they say is uh, Bob Martin and Kim Peck. Otherwise, people tend to get it half or more wrong or whatever. Um, unit testing itself is a framework even if you don't use a quote unquote like third party unit testing framework because uh, one of the principal definitions of framework is that it co makes calls into your program. It's sort of like a giant library usually that makes calls into your program. So in it, uh, Windows itself and Android and things like that, they're they're essentially frameworks because when you double click a program in Windows or Mac or whatever it's gonna the operating system is gonna call into that program and it's gonna call that main function and it's gonna start execution there so by definition that's a framework and then it also provides like system libraries right the Windows API if I wanna open a file or check the contents of a directory or something I'll use the Windows API. So if you think about it on that level, there there is a framework layer in there. So when we design and run a program, we uh, our main program, that main module, that was, that main function in there, like literally, and most or a lot of programming languages, it's literally called main, right? That function serves as like a framework into the rest of your program almost that's probably a bad way to put it but that main function is just like it's just gonna glue together your other modules in some configuration that you like right then so if you have like a module that does math and you have one that does fancy graphics or something you're gonna load those modules in that main function and you're gonna call them in some particular order say right so that think of that main part of your program as that glue. Well, what unit tests do is they sort of unglue everything. They they don't glue the pieces in any particular order. They test those those pieces in isolation independently. That's the idea. So, they're basically testing that, you know, we have a tendency to not even write component pieces, right? We have a tendency maybe to lump stuff together sometimes cuz that's easier and a lot of times that's the best way to go at first. But then we want to break things apart. Well, we have a tendency to do that in a half-baked manner, right? And rightfully so. Why should we get all elaborate? We're just trying to, like, sweep things around, make them a little better. 
So the unit tests kind of like kick off our thinking in that direction right out of the gate before it's too late, you know, so we can start naming functions properly, start creating interfaces that are going to be robust and be around and less likely to change and things like that. So anyway, um, we don't need a, I'm not going to get too much more into that right now, I'll leave it at that, but we don't need a third party unit test framework. And I think that's the biggest problem with a lot of things is that people get dumped off into these things like, because there's a lot of complexity in that. It's just like how we don't even want to write that extra function. We want to just keep everything in main or whatever, maybe for like hello world or whatever. You know, it's like, keep it simple. And that's that's a good principle. Do the simplest thing that could possibly work first. Why not? So um, anyway, all that being said, I'm going to rattle off some stuff that I do agree with from a few of these documents and put things into perspective and then do a short Python demonstration. Okay, so unit test basics from Microsoft. Check that code is working as expected by creating and running unit tests. It's called unit testing because you break down the functionality of your program into discrete testable behaviors that you can test as individual units. Okay, so right out the gate right there, um, <laughs> the, the definition of unit test is Oh, that's one of the problems with a lot of these really simple things is that people get stuck on the word. Like, and unit is an abstract word because it's supposed to be. It's like component, you know, is a component a class or is it multiple classes, you know, like. So a unit is kind of meant to be a little bit vague like that. It or So a method, an individual method could be a unit or sometimes people will say whole classes. I kind of definitely disagree with that, but um, I, they're thinking in terms of like a segmented unit, that's the way one person describes it, where they're, um, it's just like the smallest part of a program that is a conceptual piece that does something, you know, it's like an atomic configuration, so that might be multiple methods, you might have one method called like add two numbers, and that might call two uh, individual quick calls to like something else you know so anyway um, I'll just go ahead and finish reading this just think of unit test as programmer test as like individual little method test you're testing the interface and not the implementation you're just testing that hey if I've got method called uh, method A that takes parameters B and C and it's supposed to return me 42 if I give it 3 and a 5 then you write a little uh, test that like specifically test those inputs against the output. Okay, so use a unit testing framework to create unit tests, run them and report the results of these tests. Rerun unit tests when you make changes to the test that your code is still working correctly. To test that your code is still working correctly. Okay, so the unit testing framework, no matter what, even if you do 100% manual testing, it's going to be a framework because it's going to make calls into your program. What they're kind of saying here, I think, and most times you see it like this, is that they're saying a third-party unit testing framework just because if you're going to do unit testings, you're probably writing enterprise-grade software or aspiring to, and once you get into the thick of it, you're probably going to want a more heavy-duty framework uh, just because of the little nuances and stuff that start to creep in at scale. But for right out of the gate, what we're doing is totally fine. So unit testing has the greatest effect on quality of your code. Oh yeah, sorry, they kind of cram two points together in like back-to-back -back sentences. Rerun unit tests when you make changes to tests that your code is still working correctly. What that's uh, that's one of the biggest things with unit tests. A lot of people say, "Hey, how redundant to write this little test in the beginning, then make it work." It's like that's so stupid. But the thing is, is those tests are all like spotlights. They're they're watching all of that code to make sure that that behavior, that interface still operates properly. That's probably mostly going to become public interfaces and stuff like that, that, you know, if you're writing good reusable software, other people at your company in some organization, open source, who knows, like all sorts of other people could start using it. And once they start using it, you want to make sure you give them a robust as possible offering right out the gate. And you want to make sure that that that's solid, that what you give them is it going to change as far as the way that it operates it might get better under the hood but um, you know what they put in 
they can have an expectation about what they're going to get out and it would also still be extensible they could still add features you could still add features to that but um but you wouldn't be modifying the old behavior because it would be good it would be pretty solid at least it should be leaning that direction when we take this approach even if other people don't contribute the way that they should so unit testing has the greatest effect on the quality of your code when it is an integral part of your software development workflow so you don't want to do the point there is you don't want to do like sporadic testing like oh I think I'll go back like days later and maybe like add some tests here or there legacy testing if you talk to anybody who does do testing that's probably the kind of testing they hate the most so you want to do test driven development ideally where you write the test you write a failing test first and then that prompts you to go which I'm going to demonstrate in a little bit um, as soon as you write a function or other block of application code create unit tests plural that verify the behavior of the code in response to standard boundary and incorrect cases of input data and check that any explicit or implicit assumptions made by the code oh sorry I was reading that weird breath uh, and check that any explicit or implicit assumptions made by the code okay that's another thing where they're packing in a couple too many things um, so right down here there I'll go ahead and finish this where was I the check in plus with test driven development TDD you create the unit test before you write the code so you use the unit test as both design documentation and functional specifications so that's way compressed right there so test driven development you create the units before you write the code yeah true that's what you do that should be probably at the top um, I wouldn't qualify this with like a so you use the unit test as both design doc um, you can still have design documentation you should you should have like some design rationale kind of like doc you know like for sure um, this is where it gets dangerous because they these are sort of like blanketish terms you know and it's so easy to offend somebody or throw off what they define as a design doc or something like that um, but the point here again is that they can serve as a design as a for you know anything like we write code and we try and make the code self quote unquote self documenting right we try and write code that to a reasonably competent programmer it will just read to them we don't have to put extraneous comments and the external documentation and all that that will get out of sync we just we try and do the less is more approach you know and if we need external documentation oftentimes it is needed that's fine but we're not going to lean towards that you know so the unit tests themselves serve as that documentation like they literally serve hey this this addition function does this it on a very technical minor level I guess more so and as a um, as functional specifications and again it's the same thing where it's just it's the, those things in code so of course there will be functional specifications outside of it but any ones that do pop up like within the code only you could probably just leave them let the test be the redundancy there you know if nobody else really needs to know about that at least that could serve to the other programmers okay anyway what else is there anything else a lot of this is like Visual Studio specific and they have a lot of cool stuff in there but um, it's not right like I did want to kind of like cover some of this even though I didn't highlight it but like what they call for code coverage that's just that's horrible just I would say everybody give up on code coverage I don't know it's just it's the dumbest metric in the world honestly I mean if you've got to lean on that number I look at it look at it and get a gauge you know but make your own decisions about it whether it's 50 percent or 80 percent or whatever it's like it's pretty much arbitrary and as far as I know I don't use these like big bad unit testing tools but I mean I've read about them and stuff like that but what I'm reading is that like the code coverage stuff tests each statement which is probably a line of code and there could be multiple important expressions that need to get touched with that coverage that you know if it's I, I could be wrong there like anybody who does any of that unit testing with Visual Studio or whatever probably knows way better than me but and please let me know but um, I mean like what if you have like an or like a 
like a double pipe or kind of operator, you know, and you don't know, did it short circuit evaluation and not test my second expression? Like, have I ever effectively test that little second expression in like some if or something like that, you know? But then on the other hand, you don't want to test the implementation per se. Like you don't want to literally like write something that's almost hard coded to like force that or condition on that line, which people will insinuate that code coverage talk people will insinuate that and the idea is yeah if there's a path of execution in there it's probably important right your your method should do something that tests that trail but if you're have like that's just that's like implicit you like you shouldn't have to do that you know but i guess for beginners if you're using that and you're like oh i noticed that i never um actually execute this path of code I guess except with this test I don't know something like that maybe you can realize like okay I need to eliminate this path of code but um, otherwise we're really writing like the minimum amount possible and each little minimum amount should coincide to a test and there could be multiple tests added uh, shortly or long term after the fact that point at that same exact uh, behavior and test it in different ways you know some method might expect some kind of a number you might decide okay I'm gonna make sure that that number is below 100 and then later on you think oh wow I should have tested for zero too so you come in and throw in a zero test and while you're at it you think hey you know what what about negative one what about any negative number you know you just you just gotta do just enough to make sure that you feel confident like alright this looks like it's doing what it should like all the tests you'd run by hand if you had all day to run tests by hand you know like that's kind of the idea so it's also that's a good point for me to bring up right now probably too is that it's saving you from having to run like sit there like when we do these little trivial programs like if you're in college or whatever um, you can oftentimes you can run most of the software yourself and do a dozen little manual tests with it and then kill the program fire it back up and do that a dozen times you know but after a while it just you gotta think like would it be quicker to write a few tests and just when I hit go those just automatically run and then I know everything's green and like it's just so much quicker like that so that's the initial trade-off is once you're a little bit used to writing tests the idea is we should be able to write them faster so and uh, and just more fluidly so with that being said it, it shouldn't take well, one of the things I heard was um, was it strike ones it was like two strikes and then automate that was the thing or three strikes and automate or something like that and I thought that was pretty cool so once you you know you create a program that let's say just a basic program that just adds two numbers and you can input at the console once you type five plus five and rerun that program after making little edits once you do that three times let's say three strikes and you automate you automate so you stop what you're doing write a test and then from there forward, why not use test-driven test -driven development? Okay, so create the unit test project and unit test manually. That's what I highlighted because, you know, this is universal. This is going to apply more. And it explains the simple underlying concepts better than using a big giant graphical interface and like, oh, here, create 100% perfect code coverage and don't really solve my problem. I don't know. A unit test project usually mirrors the structure of a single code project. In the my bank example, you add two unit test projects named account test and bank test to the my bank solution. The test project names are arbitrary, but adopting a standard naming convention. That's I think I just meant to uh, highlight this last sentence. The test project names are arbitrary, but adopting a standard naming convention is a good idea. Um, what it looks like. and each unit test project contains classes that mirror the names of the classes in the code project so you're basically going to have like a test see they have it on the back they have account info test so this is a class that is going to test the account info like they have right here account info class and so their little convention that's not required is to add the word test plural at the end um, one of the older conventions non-Microsoft conventions is to put the word test singular in front and then we'll write our test and so here's their example what they talk about here is the uh, this 
triple a a range act assert pattern so this is just like if you are going to write a slightly meaty test which this is just this is a good probably average test example right here you're going to have your range which is your setup which is just declare variables create objects stuff like that um it can get way more complex you know you might have to set up like a database instance have it fresh and then at the end you'll want to of course like tear that down but that's where you're probably going to have like setup and tear down helper methods like or classes or whatever outside of this but anyway don't think about that too much right now here's what Microsoft recommends a range act and assert um, if anything it's set up assert and tear down if you want to think of it more like that because this act and assert are um, sometimes they're almost like one in the same but yeah so you do that um, they call this function withdraw and then they check that the balance is equal out I don't really think this is like the best way to do this but in some circumstances it is they're doing kinda of like I don't know it's cool like definitely consider this because all the values are here which is cool so you can see them all towards the top and you can make changes or just like at a glance kind of like get everything and it's in plain English it's not like current balance is just buried in here like a magic number like John Doe's kind of like almost like a magic number would be it but it's like a magic string because it's like what is that but we know it's a name because it looks like one right but um, numbers are way more likely to be quote unquote magic where it's just like oh that just works right but we don't know what that number is anyway I'm babbling on so assert is like the the deal with that's kind of the deal with unit testing is that you just assert that something's true and of course you can assert that something's not true and da, 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 da. but on the most basic level you're just asserting that something's true that it didn't fail all right is there any more in this I can't believe how much I'm babbling all right uh, anyway you can check out this documentation on your own if you want I would recommend trying not to get too caught up with it unless maybe you're like a C sharp Microsoft E dot net E kind of person but even then don't you know <laughs> I don't know whatever okay and the funny thing was is that if you dig into that doc documentation a little bit it will actually reference this Google <laughs> documentation which is cool but this is another this is a framework by Google called Google test I don't like frameworks but whatever it's cool to know about it's open source Microsoft even suggests taking a look at it uh, multi-platform but what I'm just kinda like pilfering out of this is that some of these principles that these frameworks have that they're kinda mentioning in their introductory text here so this one's saying that um, tests should be independent and repeatable it's a pain to debug a test that succeeds or fails as a result of other tests so that pretty much explains the first sentence and the second you you're just you're gonna run them a lot so you don't want it to like I don't know I guess delete your whole hard drive that might not be a good repeatable test unless you have a way to back it up and restore it automatically and then independent you don't want it to rely on another like literal test function because things just get way weird really quick if you go that route so clean and separated Tests should be well organized and reflect the structure of the tested code. So there's another one you'll see structure come up all the time in different people um, talking about it. And it's not the implementation structure. It's not like that micro implementation. It's the uh, it's like more of the shape structure, like the architectural structure, the that type of a thing, like against the class. You could just maybe think of it like that for now, like you're going to test class for class kind of thing. When tests fail, they should provide as much information about the problem as possible. Enough said. Um, small isolated tests should pretty much, you can just go look at that test and go, what's it failing? You know, then you should be able to go to that one little problem and in a very straightforward and possibly short chain be able to figure that out if you can supply extra information that will help narrow it down even quicker then why not throw in another line or two tests should be fast 
that's one of those things like anybody who knows the basics of testing or has tested knows that you don't want to sit around for a half hour every time you compile just to see if it like one little change works so the test I mean ideally if they can complete in under, under a minute then that's ideal um, it will take you about 10 minutes to learn the basics and get started so that's if you've never really tested if you have the right information and not somebody who talks long-winded forever like me you can uh, possibly learn this stuff really quick test use assertions to verify the tested codes behavior if a test crashes or has a failed assertion then it fails otherwise it succeeds all simple stuff right a test suite contains one or many tests you should group your tests into test suite that reflect the structure of the tested code but once again not the not the like method implementation just the method interface you test a class or function by making assertions about its behavior yes that's probably about all this general beginner specific stuff in that one too okay so over here we have the boost library um, documentation slightly older documentation at least uh, so this is a C++ library that offers tons of stuff and one of the things it offers is a testing framework I guess I don't personally use it but anyway if we come down here at first I was gonna freak out on this text I was like oh he's saying whatever about hello world oh and if you want to find this if you just search for this text right here you can find it without having to type in that URL um, but yeah he he what but he does a fairly good example with it and he starts out saying that you know it looks so simple that you don't have to test it and everything and that's where I almost like I had to cool down so that I could read the rest of it and uh, but then he says hey there's there's hidden complexity under the hood even hello world hides complexities of this sort symbol seeming call to uh, standard out so there's a lot going on here and I tend to throw a little fit about hello world as an example because it's like yeah people like to see the basics for desktop or whatever main entry hello world it's just the way we've been I guess back in the day when all there was was terminal consoles it's like oh cool whatever but now there's graphical user interfaces terminal consoles logging like whatever you know multiple interfaces web interfaces um, there's so much going on and that's one of the big big code smell problems right here is that we have this main function which like I mentioned before should be gluing pieces together like gluing external modules together it definitely shouldn't be having the whole program hard-coded in one statement like this so as simple as it is that's the cool thing it's simple right but the trade-off is it's rigid and not flexible it's not good for extension I can't turn this into a graphical user interface program cleanly um, that type of a thing so that's but this document right here is worth reading the things that I get a little bit different on a course is the same thing when he's talking about uh, defining what a unit test is he talks about a units the smallest conceptually whole segment of the program examples might be a single class single function it's not even worth worrying about that it's not even worth defining those things that it's only going to cause confusion and so here's what I did that's why I opened these tabs up here because I went in and like literally defined these terms in Wiktionary like unit so what they're talking about I think is like a work unit down here something more like that right um, but if you come up to one of these more primary definitions like the military uh, ones those ones like a military unit if you think of a test is like a test battery you know like that you're gonna throw against something I think that that makes way more sense to me so um, if you look like it's an organization of a subdivision a group and a task force and so if we look up task force it's like a group of people working towards a particular task project activity especially assigned to a particular capacity CEO's task force da 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 so that just you know it sounds action like like it's this this uh, military unit ready to take action and then active duty a state in which the military performs duties full-time basis there's these are uh, tests that are run every single time you compile right 
as opposed to a reserve or only occasional performs military duties. So the reserve, I don't know, maybe acceptance testing or integration, whatever, if you want to like try and wrap the whole concept together. But that, and then the whole thing is that those those units um, also augment in here, where is that? Serve the active duty as a unit or to augment or be augmented by another unit, which totally, in my opinion, lines up with the uh, the unit testing as well so to go increase become greater we keep adding to the unit test the unit tests are augmenting our original code you know da 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 like I think you're probably either saying yeah I totally see the connection or you just still disagree with me so I'll leave it at that um, so think of the unit tests as these battery tests what they are is they're programmer tests and they're testing the behavior through the methods the input against its output. Here's a more confusing method that they use as an example and um, if you come down here he starts to let you know like hey yeah there's a few things that could go wrong but there's a few more things that could go wrong. In this unit proper testing includes checking the behavior in each possibility. It also includes checking the function by giving inputs where the correct answer is known and checking the results against that answer. So it sounds stupid basic and it is that's how easy it is that's all we're doing that's all each little thing each programmer test is doing when a unit is completed and tested it is ready for integration with the other units in the program this is this is integration this is integration should also be tested so this integration should also be tested which is an integration test of course at this point the test cases focus on the interaction between the units. Tests are designed to exercise each way the units can affect each other. So that's exactly that. And here's the best part that I'm usually arguing is that this is the point in development where proper unit testing really shines. If each unit is doing what it should be doing and not creating unexpected side effects, any issues in testing, a set of integrated units must come from how they are passing information. So it's not so much the little unit themselves most likely I mean there are possibilities right but it's most likely something in the way that those those uh, modules and or if you want to call them units by their definition you know those methods something away there by the way they're getting glued together is wrong at that higher level so at this integration level more likely so by doing our unit tests in the fashion that we've discussed so far we're basically helping to ensure that the vast majority of stuff or you know are most likely to come from there of course there's always stuff we can't especially with, against any complexity I mean once you get to stuff like this or more um, you can't it's just it becomes impossible right it's like a halting problem type of deal thus nearly intractable problem of finding an error while many units interact becomes the less intimidating problem of finding the breakdown in communications so instead of trying to trace out some weird little error like if if we hadn't used test driven development and our stuff was bigger chunks rather than being broken down to like more finite pieces um, it'd be hard to trace that error but now we know it's probably right there at the integration level you know so that's cool and if it's not if it turns out to be at the unit test or you know at the programmer test level then we know hey we know we found it and it took an integration test to get it but now we can go write a unit test at that you know at that programmer test level and fix that behavior whatever and then when we put it back in integration now we know once again okay it's probably going to be the way they're glued together okay so now we're going to get a little dirty with python and let's see here file new okay so what this is is this is going to be the most bait this is going to be the hello world in Python I'll just call it hello alright there it is boom that's it right F5 to run okay to save um, let's see here I have a Python folder I was already saving this stuff in Unit testing, and then I save this one. Don't read those other names; I will spoil it for you. So there, it prints hello, 
right there. Um, that's it. I mean, that's that's Hello World in Python. What's going on here is this is a script language, and mostly in script languages, they have whatever's just run right there. Is, that's like the main program, right? This is um, if we look at the file name, it's Hello Pi or whatever, but this is the equivalent of main so I could come down here and I could put this in a function so in Python this is like how you define a function right and then instead of doing uh, curly braces they just do a colon and then this indention is mandatory like I have to I mean I can choose the amount of spaces I have to keep it consistent but um, this indention is kinda of like saying everything that's how you denote what would be in the curly braces so once I come back against the far left rail over there, I'm back outside of that main function, right? So it says print hello, we'll say print hello from main. And then down here we'll say print hello. Or we'll call this function just to, oh, it's, it's simple but confusing. Okay, so print hello out here. And then we'll just run that. So we got hello out here, but we didn't get the hello main. So what's going on is when the script starts executing, it reads in this function. It says, okay, there's a function called main right there. Like it remembers from now on, there's a function called main, but that's all. And I mean, it probably like parses this into some bytecode or something, but it doesn't execute it. Then it comes down here and since this is outside of a function, it's effectively like a main function. So it executes this code. So that's all we get. If we want to execute this code we got to call it so we can call it with main save it and run it and there it is hello out here and then hello from main on the second line because it was called second if we try and call main up here we'll get an error because it, it hasn't yet read in as it comes down it's really literally top to bottom left to right so as it comes down it's going to go main and try and run it but it hasn't parsed this line yet so let's try it out so we get error name main is not defined right so anyway that was that and we can also change this to something else because Python's main is like this is being run in main this is getting defined in main like that's our real main is this little hidden thing it's actually called in Python behind the scenes it's actually called main like that that's what the what that whole background area like this far left rail is called so we could change this to funk it's an arbitrary name and it still works and that's also why you'll why you'll uh, see stuff like if uh, name compares to main then we can print something like that there it is we're in main because basically when it runs a program it will run this background stuff but if it gets loaded as a library if you know anything about that in Python then it obviously it won't so but it will run the background stuff right yeah it will run the regular background stuff if you load it as a library I'm pretty sure double check me on that and it will go through so you could get errors or you could get output or stuff like that but you can do that thing I did where it's like um, if you know name is main then and that will only run that on that condition and what a lot of people will do is they'll tell that to call a main function and they'll name that main but anyway I just wanted to kind of like give that overhead because I know a lot of people don't know Python but as you can see right here what we're doing is we're effectively like we're just looking at the different ways to create a function in print main right or print hello so let me move on from there so the next best thing to do to go from print hello don't worry about main or any of that stuff anymore so there it is hello clear that out it's the way real programmers have to clear out the Python shell then we'll come down and say that's wrong I'm looking at my notes over here So we need to put this in a in a uh, 
a function of its own because of like I was saying before you want to separate your main program from your print so what we'll do is we'll create a display function we'll call it display it'll take a string and it'll print that string and we'll call it display hello save it and run it so there it's working just like the old program right little more complex though it's not just you know we got a little function to find now um, you should be more comfortable with those now but still one more line even some more complexity you know So we'll go down here and we'll assert, here's the basic thing with that. I'm kind of, one reason I don't like going through from notes is because then I'm not always feeling it the same way. I've tried it both ways, like off the cuff and from notes. And it's like, if I have notes and maybe I'm less likely to forget some stuff, but then I just like, I'm referring to the notes and I don't get into that groove, you know, I'm not like feeling the code like I should. But anyway, that's why I'm getting these weird pauses going on. Like, why did I do it that way? Oh yeah. So, so we understand what's going on there, I hope, anyway. And then what we're going to do is we're going to throw in that assert. We're going to say assert. We can put it right in front of display. So this is like the most basic form of like testing we can do. It's improper test-driven development because we're not letting it like drive our architecture properly just yet. It's like, yeah, I broke it off into this... Um, into this other function or whatever, like separate the um, the output the IO so that's like that's a good idea but I don't know this is like my beta explanation of this I plan to go back and try and just make it more succinct and more just digestible but anyway um, we're gonna assert that this display what this effectively does is say hey this function has to return true or I'm gonna fail it's a keyword in Python, and right there, last line, on, Py on most languages, the top line is going to give you the error you need to care about. On Python, it's going to be the last line, So, which is cool for beginners, but for anybody experienced programming, it's like, oh, you're used to the top line. But anyway, assertion error, so that didn't work. It didn't return true, so here's what we do. We just make it return true. We're going to say, hey, if you got this far, you know, this is good enough for us now. In the future, just returning true from this function might not be a thorough enough test, but do the minimum amount, do the smallest amount necessary to get the test to pass, right? So return true, save, run, hello, no assertion error. So there it is. There's the most basic tested example. So we're good now. Now we're, like, actually testing. We've got our I.O. moved out and we can test it like that but um we're we're only a fraction of the way there it's not a huge undertaking but we're just I'm going to close this for now oh wasn't supposed to close that file weird So unit test hello, is that the one? Okay, anyway, whatever. So this needs to basically get broken up into different files. So our our main program is gonna call display without without the assertion, right? We'll do hello from test down here so we know. And uh, the assertion is going to be run from the test. So w if you can kind of see the parallel here, I'll go ahead and save and run this so you can see they do the same thing. Hello from main, hello from test. Our tests are stepping in for main, like I said earlier. Main is kind of like, which w in this case we're going to save main. Well, I'll just, I'm just going to blast through this and shut up. Okay, so the first thing, test-driven development, we need to write a failing test first because there's three parts here. We've got our um, our so-called unit by the people who I think misnome it, but um, it's uh, it's our our method, it's our behavior, it's our 
interface that we intend to publish and use. So this is what needs to be tested. This is our program. This is basically where these meet the business and users and uh, all that kind of stuff. Maybe even integration, arguably. So that's a whole nother piece, right? And then our test is supposed to be separate from that. You know, it our test doesn't rely on this is a big old wad of tape. Our test untapes everything, so it's a third entity. So the first thing we're going to do in test-driven development is cut that out of there, open up a new file, come over here, paste in our test. And we're going to put this in a function like we should, following that convention Microsoft said, and we're going to call it test display true. And what that kind of is following is test is um, says that it's a test, display is the method, and uh, true is what we're going to expect back from it. So actually according to more of the strictly Microsoft follow kind of convention would be display, um, the method you're going to call, what's unique about how you're going to call it, display string, and then the expected result true. So like that. I don't like to really do more than three words if I can help it, but you could do test, display, string, true. You could even leave off tests, but um, I think PyUnit requires you to put like a test prefix. It's probably an option to uh, change that requirement as well. And then of course it's Python, so we have to indent properly. So that's going to um, define that function, display, uh, I forgot to do that and it's going to make sure you know we already kind of tested that line but anyway let's go ahead and run this F5 okay to save yeah and then we'll save it over and see the naming convention there is test underscore display just like how we were using that for the class names the uh, method names and now for the file name as well or the module name effect effectively so modules kind of like a a class but in the old school procedural scripting world, um, it's not a class per se, but it's sort of like a little container of some behavior and some values and stuff like that. So we can see we didn't get anything because we don't call this, it just loads this function into memory and then it comes down here into this main plane, we could call it, and uh, there's no call to it. So we need to add that call. Test display true um, and what this this is pretty common too especially if you write your own framework like what I'm doing is that you're just gonna have like your tests that match a class or a module and you're gonna define all those little tests in there and then in the main part of that module or even class um, you'll pick which test you want to call and then so if I did want to just I'll go ahead and run it and we can see it's not defined. So that's our failing test. That's the first, that's actually a positive thing in test driven development. That red right there and that name error, name display is not defined. Congratulations, step one, TDD. Um, so if I didn't want to run that test, I could just, oh yeah, Python. So comment it out like that. Hit a five. And then it just goes back to like I, that line wasn't even there. So that's the cool thing if you have like a dozen tests and you just want to have some tests that you run sometimes with your own framework or whatever, you can do that. Um, we'll put it back in, run it, get that failing test. Name display is not defined. Oh, of course, you know, let's go back over here. <laughs> yeah, we have a function called to this function and this is defined, but literally we don't have any name display. We don't have like, we're calling it right there, but that's not defining it. Um, so we just we need to import the display module oh wait we don't have one so let's go back over here to our code and this is the main remember that's not the display this is the display right this is that function that we're trying to call that's missing so let's go ahead and cut that probably a better idea to cut it after the new file but okay and paste it in the new file and we'll do we'll save this as display.py conveniently enough you can name it whatever you want and um, it's going to display stuff so let's come back over here and try and run it again 
yeah we know it's going to fail still right because we haven't imported it but I'm just showing that just keep going through those fail steps every single time you know um, and I haven't even compiled this one either so let's compile this one which is run F5 okay so that one compiles without error that's good and then we come back over here and import and even just compiling I mean in Python it's arguable whether or not you're compiling but technically you're not right you're interpreting it but at, even at interpretation time or compile time or whatever uh, it is performing some tests like in a statically typed language where I do have to say you know like an integer is the specific number is an integer or something and then I try to pass out a string and it says can't compile you're passing a letter for a string or something that is you know a layer of testing right there that's a, a layer of um, compile time testing Python doesn't have that check I mean in some cases it, you might effectively get a check like that but I could pass a number for s and Python's not going to know so that's something else to test for but anyway we need to import the display module and if we just do that we'll have to type display display and I'll just go ahead and do that right now because we have to reference this module and then I chose to name the function the same as the module file name so that's why we have this display display thing going on here but anyway let's run it cool hello from test so it's sending this test data over to that uh, display function it's printing hello from test and returning true so that's cool but my code you know one of the things about uh, test driven development is the refactoring thing too it's like okay I got it working let's refactor this let's bring this in as a little bit more descriptive as console I mean this is where it gets to be more personal taste maybe um, so that it, this is more specific it see how the code becomes more self descriptive more self uh, documenting so now we can try running that and hello from test and then one thing I can do over here is test um, I can just even say like test console true like that and in Python the cool thing too is I can actually because I don't want to just you know that set up and tear down code right I don't want to share that amongst everybody if I can help it maybe that one maybe display as console might be one that I do want to share but for now just to kind of follow those guidelines until I catch myself repeating code too much just think of that three strikes thing test display not true is not defined test display. oh forgot to rename it right here so you probably want to if you do especially anything of any complexity you probably already know is to do the find and replace like don't goof off like I do okay so that's all working still even after the refactor cool okay so uh, what do we got here so we have our test we have this but we don't have our main program so let's go ahead and get our main program going and we'll save this as file save as and then we'll call it main so you can see we started off with hello pi and we had all three of these other things in there and now we're breaking it off into these more conceptualized pieces um, yeah replace that so now this is going to be the main thing so if we run this one we're going to get an error so it's a little miniature test driven development here too but we know we need to import um, display as console and then we can say console so now it matches with this one All right and then if we run it so hello from main that time so it's just it depends on where we run it from if we run it from here get hello from test from here hello from main and then of course we have our that's our our actual stuff right there so one of the things we could do too is um you know in this dis test display true thing if we passed it like a number that's going to work but if we didn't want it to take a number then we would uh come in here and say like you know before we printed it we'd say like there would be code here to check for number 
So we'd write a failing test that says, uh, make sure that this doesn't accept a number, you know, in pseudocode effectively some way, and then we'd run it, and it would take the number or whatever, and then we'd say, okay, that's not the answer we're looking for, and then we'd go in and implement the code, refactor, and da 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 da. So have I covered everything? Then there's that arrange act assert test should be automated and independent. Um, I think I think I've about covered it. I mean, let me see if it'll, let me close this without. Cool. So yeah, there it is. There's how you start to separate things. Ideally, you want to do a thing dependency injection. That reminds me. I've already taken forever, so I'm going to take forever again and uh, go in here, reference my own Stack Overflow thing, because I can't ever remember this basic little structure for, I don't use Python GUIs that often. So this was about how to send command line arguments to Python, and I offered two solutions. I think this one's better because it's just literally like, you know, more like two lines of code. But um, this one's like slightly fancier because it pops up this like little message box thing. So anyway, this is um, just importing system stuff to check out if there's arguments passed. This is just checking to see if um, if the program's being run within idle, which offers that sim this is this is idle right here. So you can tell it's similar kind of uglyish display or whatever, but I like it. And this all right here is all the code for um for this box itself. So we'll go over here, we'll do file, new file, uh save as and we'll call this one display GUI dot pi we'll paste that stuff in there Let's see here if we can detent all this oh it's going the wrong way ah oh, come on alright in other news oh that one looks like it's supposed to be Give it a double. I'm probably forgetting some shortcut. What control shift? Okay. So let's check out. We don't need that. Um, all we need is that OK button. So this is all boilerplate command line arguments. We better change that to like. We'll just put something generic for now. Um, button, we want that. I guess this entry thing. That must be that input box that we don't need. Big deal, whatever. And then we want to take in... Oh, I can't believe I put all that over. I should have just left it in a function. What oh, door? Okay. This will be the display function. So this is kind of like an interface. Uh, display the string. If you think about it, that's what's kind of confusing me. I'm not used to Python. Um, this is probably one of the instances where it kind of justifies maybe going the object-oriented route more. Adds a little bit more complexity again, but only slightly. Uh, but because it's hard to think of like... I'm probably forgetting something really basic, but how to like sort of document the interface like you do in a class, you're sort of like documenting an interface. Um, and then in the C programming language, you do a header file where you basically like declare all your stuff without implementing it. But anyway, that's the cleanest way. But right now it's so simple, we can just conceptually know like, okay, there's just, we gotta call a display function. And maybe this was the way that it's always supposed to be done in Python, but um, we're just, it's kind of like if you think about overriding something or having, I hate to say it, but like two different classes inheriting from a superclass that, you know, like an abstract superclass that has like 
uh, you know, it, a display function that takes a string. So we're doing two. This is the whole benefit of decoupling that output. Like I said in that Hello World program, this is exactly why you'd want to do that. So we'll just make the button on the um, the button text say the hello thing. So we're going to pass that the string. Okay. So save it and run it. Cool. No errors. And don't hang on every little thing the way I'm doing it. I know you're probably not that crazy, but um, I'm probably skipping over huge things that I wouldn't do if I'd actually like got my head together right before I did this. What am I doing? Okay, there's our old display function. Here's our test display true. Okay, let's uh, let's do a test display. GUI kind of breaking consistency there with the naming for now so note that um, that that's not a good practice display so I'll just go if that's not a good practice you know what I'll do a good practice and test display console and most assertions are it's expected to be true so we can just imply that um, display and I shouldn't even be making these two changes I should have changed the name of that function in that call and tested that only and you know because otherwise it's like especially once you get a lot more code if you run through and start making a bunch of little changes like oh I should have done this and that uh, it could turn it to a nightmare quick so do that this time we're going to import display 2 is what we'll name it as GUI assert GUI dot display. Um, this one's supposed to say console, and this one will say, or hello console will say, and this one will say hello GUI period for good measure. Do double space, I think might be. Pep eight. All right. So now we'll just go ahead, like I was saying before, we don't want to test the console. Or no, we could because we import the display console in here. That was one of the benefits of um, of dropping that import in there, in theory. So let's check them out. Oh, hey, no module found display two. So what did I do with that module? Did I already save it? Display GY, my bad. Um, save and run. And there it is. It just says message box. So name OK is not defined. Command OK. But that's a start. Um, Okay, so we're done with main. We know it works. Where's this OK thing at? Command OK. Not defined. Okay, command okay. Did we not pass a string in that test? Test hello GUI. Then we go to the GUI display. Takes in a string S. Is S used for anything else? Hmm, maybe I'll leave this on there. Oh yeah, okay, that compiles, that's good. So what am I not seeing here? Name okay is not defined. Line 10. Well, I think you get the idea. I'm just so rusty on my GUI code that 
I'm not getting what's going on here. So line 10 is this line. Command OK. Let's look it up. TK button. Help. Wrong help. <laughs> 